memes. You know them. I know them. They're everywhere. You log on to any social media platform, you'll see memes. You check your DMs, your friends have sent you a meme. You go to your living room, your dad shows you a meme, your mom shows you a meme, your dog just did this thing and that's a meme. But what is a meme? Now, I think the younger audiences in here may have never had to ask this question a day in their lives, but I can see that the adults in here may be a little more familiar with having to ask this question. Huh? Uh, but that joke has gotten old. Maybe about five, six years ago, memes were new and people didn't know what they were. But now everyone does. Even if you don't necessarily know the word meme, you've definitely come across one in some type of way. Everyone knows what memes are. But how can we define them? Some might say that they are a funny image with relatable text on it. Sure. But they can also be GIFs or video clips, or songs, movies, or animals, or even a word. See, the word meme was derived from the Greek word mimema, which means something imitated. The term itself was first coined by evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins in 1976 in his book, The Selfish Gene, in which he defined a meme as a unit of cultural information that is spread through imitation. That's right. A meme is a unit, a unit of cultural information that is spread through imitation. Now, Dawkins didn't necessarily create memes as we know now. Of course, it was back in 1976. He merely crafted a term for all these things to fall under. And when he invented the term meme, he was thinking more of cultural memes, things like fashion senses or skills or behaviors. Dawkins likened memes to biological genes, calling memes the cultural equivalent of a gene that is passed on through evolution. So memes are the genes of our culture, meaning that they can hold information they can spread from person to person, and they can evolve and mutate over time. So let's go back to this. Now, this is one of the more recent memes, a favorite of mine, I'll admit. It's a little obscure, but I don't doubt that some of you have seen this before. This is actor Jonathan Banks in his uh, Breaking Bad promotional character poster. If you're wondering where the joke is, this is the full image. Now, it still doesn't make sense. But this is uh, an example of a, um, a meme that is fully evolved, a fully grown tax-paying meme, if you will. This uh, meme became, began its life cycle in 2019 on Reddit with this image. The meme then begins its life cycle uh, in the same way all memes do, through imitation. So a few days later, uh, another meme is posted on Reddit by another user using the same format. By now, you guys probably get the joke, right? It's simple wordplay. Various phrases and common idioms are reinterpreted as if they were being uh, addressed to a student, a kid, per se. So how do we go from this to whatever this is? See, things cycle through the internet very fast. It's a common criticism of today that uh, we lack a sustainable attention span because of the internet. And it's true. We eat up content day by day, and we need new stimulation all the time. So what happens when you tell a joke one too many times? It gets old, right? It gets boring. The internet now thinks that it's cliche or corny. You've seen this happen with, what, Coldplay, skinny jeans, what have you. Call it diminishing returns or whatever. Things just get uncool, so they have to adapt. So we go through the same loops over again, except we don't. We have the setup. The teacher says the class is going to finger paint. Okay, check. And then we have the punchline. There's a kid named Finger. Wait, that's not how it's supposed to go. Now, all of a sudden, we have broken down the format. The walls that have been holding this joke together have come crumbling down. And it's purely nonsensical now. What does this mean? Is the class going to use him to paint? Is he going to paint? Uh, 
The absurdity of a child named Finger becomes way more apparent, acting as a non-punchline and thus delivering the final joke. That, coupled with this smug, cinematically lit picture of this old man, creates visual juxtaposition. And it sets the joke. Jonathan Banks is clearly not a kid. Is he the one who's going to finger paint? Uh, why is he smirking at such a mundane thing? At heart, this is humor through subversion, one of the oldest ways to garner laughter. It's such a silly image at first, but it employs... Uh, various visual techniques and aspects of language to make us laugh. And when you think of memes, you may think them crude or immature, a uh, result of the internet's juvenile side. But I urge you to think again. So by now, you've probably seen all the ways that uh, memes use visual language and uh, aspects of visuals to uh, deliver jokes. Now, uh, Richard Dawkins was brought back in 2013 to actually comment on the adoption of his term by the internet, to which he replies that an internet meme is a hijacking of the original idea and that instead of mutating by random change and spreading by a form of Darwinian selection, they are instead altered by human creativity. Creativity. That's the key point here. Memes are sort of an art form in the sense that they require human skill and creativity to talk about human emotions or human situations. Now, it's funny because these are an art form and they've uh, never been owned by anyone. They are the peoples. If you've ever seen a corporation try to use memes, you've always seen that it has definitely uh, been thrown back in their face and failed. Now, memes are the peoples, and uh, they have this corporate uh, corruption immunity that other art forms don't have. Films, for example, have been suffering at the hands of corporations as various remakes and remakes of our favorite classic movies have been put out, or when films are made entirely to serve the construction of a larger cinematic universe. And memes don't have that corrupt corporate corruption. However, I'd be lying if I said that they were immune to all types of corruption. Memes are definitely susceptible to being used for hate. Now, I'm sure you guys have seen this guy, right? Yes. This is Pepe the Frog, an anthropomorphic frog character uh, who was introduced in 2005 in a comic series called Boys Club by a cartoonist called Matt Fury. Now, did you know that this little frog is listed in the Anti-Defamation League's list of hate symbols? I sure didn't. What happened? See, the nature of memes was exploited by users on 4chan to create imitations of Pepe saying alt-right, radical, xenophobic things. Now, these memes surged in popularity in 2016 as the U.S. elections arose, and they were responsible for so much extreme hate perpetuated towards minorities. However, there's a bright side, as all things have. And the bright side is that memes belong to the people. They don't belong to the alt-right Nazi trolls on 4chan. They belong to us, the people. And within people, there is hate, but there is also love. So in 2019, the protesters of Hong Kong, who were wildly unaware of the trouble that Pepe was causing in America, found this little frog cute, and they made him a symbol of their revolution. Pepe has since been reimagined with a yellow hard hat and tear gas around him as a freedom fighter as a journalist and first aid worker. And he's also been he's also been in messaging apps as sticker packs for messaging apps like WhatsApp and Telegram that are common in Hong Kong. And he has become a symbol of hope. What once was an icon of hate in one part of the world to one group of people has become a symbol of hope to another group of people in another part of the world. Memes are universal to the human condition. Within us is the instinct to imitate everyone so that we can fit in. That's just science. That's how it's always been since the beginning of humans, back when 
being social had to become part of our biology because billions of years ago, if you didn't fit into a tribe, you didn't belong, then that meant that you lacked stability and security, which meant that you would die early. That instinct still remains in us. We can still feel it. That instinct is foundational to the principle of Dawkins meme theory. That instinct is why Hillary Clinton decided to reference Pokemons in 2016. That instinct is why corporations like to jump on meme bandwagons, and that instinct is why teachers sometimes like to put little memes in our slideshow so that they can connect to us better. Memes have become an integral part of the 21st century communication. They allow us to form bonds and teach us to laugh at ourselves a little. So I urge you to partake in this process. Memes are rewarding. If you make a meme, then you've tapped into your creativity and then you've made something. You get the satisfaction of that. And if you understand a meme, then you get to have a laugh. You get, to, you get the satisfaction of understanding a joke. And if you don't join the meme bandwagon now, you will miss out, I'm sorry to say, because they have become a integral part of 21st century communication. They're a whole spectrum of communication. And if you can't tap into the spectrum, then you will lack an essential gene to survive in the future. So what do you do? Well, you take a popular meme format. There are thousands. And you put relatable text over it. You know, maybe a situation that you've been in. Make it about something relatable, something that everyone can relate to. Make it funny. Make a meme.